hi to everybody. Thank you so much for joining us um, for the launch of um, Sadiqa Kogi's uh, new book, Your Crib, My Kibla. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Sadiq? Yeah, Kibla. Uh, yeah. Kibla, yeah. Beautiful. So um, for those who don't know um, Sadiq and his writing, we've published quite a few of his poems in Verity La and his incredible, um, incredible uh, voice. So I'll just read his bio and introduce him. So Sadiq Dekogi's poetry collection, Your Crib, My Kibla, University of Nebraska Press, 2021, was named one of the 29 best poetry collections by Oprah Daily. That would have been a, a big deal. Uh, his chapbook, Inside the Flower Room, was selected by Kwame Dawes and Chris Abani for the AB, uh, APBF New Generation African Poets chapbook series. His poems have appeared in the Cincinnati Review, Gulf Coast, Canyon Review, Oxford Poetry, Poetry Society of America, Prairie Schooner, and other literary journals. He is a finalist of the Brunei, uh, Brunel International African Poetry Prize and a recipient of fellowships and grants from Nebraska Arts Council, Pen America, Obsidian Foundation and the University of Nebraska Lincoln, where he is a PhD student and serves as an assistant poetry editor for Prairie Schooner. Um, Sadiq, that's quite an impressive list um, for, a, for a pretty young man we've got there. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you so much. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, um, so um, we're talking today about your, your newest book, um, Your Crib, My Kibla, and I was wondering, um, for those who don't know what uh, Kibla is, if you could, um, if you could explain the, the title for us. Yeah, um, so um, I'm, I'm just going to start from the Kibla. Um, I'm a Muslim, and um, the direction that we face to pray is um, what we call Kibla. We face um, the Kaaba, regardless where we are. And so that direction is um, um, called the Kibla. Mm -hmm. um, the, the title, Your Crib, obviously Your Crib um, is the, the, the place um, where we normally like lay uh, our child to, to rest. And you know, when, when people lose loved ones, it, it, we just make um, all of the things that they have touched or embodied um, like, a, like a holy site or a, a ritual site. And so I, I was struggling with the title because like I, I saw a title in even my poems. Um, and so for the book, it was, um, it was very stressful and it went through a lot of titles from this grief to after 21 days. And then the last version was um, your crib my cathedral but then you know i'm muslim and you know that just complicates it a lot and so one day i was um, um looking for the masjid um during friday prayers and um i had missed um the one that i i regularly go to and so i brought up my phone and i checked the kibla app just to give me a sense of direction where to face to pray and it dawned on me that that was the missing piece of my, um, my book's title, and I um, replaced Kibla with Cathedral. Oh, that's beautiful. Thanks, thanks for Sadiq. Um, for those who don't know, um, just a little background on the book, you know, it charts a sort of a, the year after the very um, tragic and sad death of your beautiful little girl Baha. So it's a very personal book, um, dealing with grief, uh, loss, you know, memory, power of words and imagination. You know, it's an incredible book. Um, yeah, Robbie and I were completely blown away upon reading it. Sorry, Robbie, I didn't introduce you. I'm not a very good Zoom host. I, not at all. Would you like to say say a few words about, about your impressions of the book, Robbie? Uh, it's, it's one of those rare books that it's pretty hard to to summarise because it says it says so much and I don't think you can really give give it justice properly uh it it's it's heartbreaking it's breathtaking the form the poems it's not a word out of place it's just a brilliant brilliant book mm -hmm. so it's, it's stunning it's, it's one of the most moving collections i can remember reading so thank you thank you so much um that's um very generous of you 
I remember, um, Sadiq, when your first, um, I think one of the first poems you sent to Verity last several years ago now, um, and, you know, we get about 500 poems probably every reading um, period, and, and Robbie and I really love reading them together, and um, I remember him just sending me a note saying, who is this guy? Like, you know, I don't know who he is, but you've got to read this poem, you know. And so then we were just like, wow, this person, you know, you have a very, you have a unique voice and it's very powerful, very heartfelt. And it's, it's, it's been really, uh, it's amazing to read the book, um, having followed your work um, across these years um, and just to see it. And it's just, it's, it's such it's such powerful work in, and as Michelle said, such a unique voice as well. Um, it's yeah, it's been a real real pleasure to be able to read it um, with that personal context of of knowing your work um, mm -hmm. for quite a long time as well. Yeah, um, I was um, just um, trying to recollect what poem um, of mine was published first in Virgila, and now I remember it's um, I think um, virtually the opening poem of my chapter. Yeah. Um, and also that's um, comment side. And then um, there's a, another poem that is um, included in this um, collection that you also published. Um, it grew a lot shorter in the book, but <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, yeah, thank you for, you know, like always um, providing myself and my words um, platform, you know, to speak to a lot of people that's, um, you know, it's always been a special space for me. and the work that you both do it's um great and um fascinating and inspiring oh thank you so much that's really kind to dick um i was wondering um just to sort of begin speaking about the book um with the poems as i said it, it sort of charts about a year of, of time of, of um from when your your daughter um died to you know going through the uh, sort of a, a journey of grief um and so the book has many different stages and voices um did was that written during that time during that year or is it are some of the poems written retrospectively yeah so um because um when she passed um during that time i was um walking in another city um which was um about four hours away from my hometown where um, Baha, my my wife and our son Rehan lived, and and, and so sort of like shuffling and you know making the journey back home every other week. Um, unfortunately, when she passed, I was at work, um, and when I received the phone call, I had a pen and there was um, um, a notebook on the desk, and I just um, found myself scribbling words. Um, there was like a lot of noise that I wanted to contain, right? Just to um, be able to reflect and understand or at least attempt to understand what had just happened. And for me, the poems have always been a way to, you know, self-reflect, to make sense of my world, um, to try and communicate about what I feel inside because, you know, I suffer a lot of um, social anxiety. And so that has been my process up to that moment. And now in retrospect, I think all of that um, exercise in trying to find a voice to talk about what I have been experiencing before that time of death might have, you know, been preparing me um, for that moment. Um, because then at that particular time, I had a voice, you know, just to navigate what my body was feeling, what my heart felt like and I started scribbling words and it, it was like a ritual for me every single day I wrote a poem um, and and that was a process that lasted about seven months so um, with the exception of um, the last poem which was written on the day of um, 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 her, her first year anniversary of her death um, but every other thing was um, literally written in the first seven months afterwards. Um, and for me, I was writing not as a poet, but, you know, just as a father who wanted to find the words to say um, what I was feeling. Um, and because, like, when we lose people, right, um, the, the, the other loved people 
and the other people that we loved around us, you know, would um, try to console us, right? And at that particular time, I thought all of that to be noise, right? Um, because I wanted to hear only one voice. Unfortunately, um, that's the voice that I couldn't hear. And all of that, you know, was blocking me from trying to um, assess, you know, um, that voice in terms of memory and the poems allowed me to do that. And so every single day um, at lunch break, I spent 10 minutes, sometimes 15 minutes, just, you know, scribble words um, in, in, in this emotional outburst. Um, and that was the process for seven months. Mm, incredible. It sounds incredibly intense. Um, I was thinking as I read the first section, you know, it's written in the third person. So it's quite unusual, I suppose, um, for, for poetry. And I was wondering um, your reasons um, behind, behind making the choice. Yeah, um, I've said this, you know, like, it's always the first question that I get asked about the book. Um, and it's one that, you know, like, I'm like, yeah, I can take credit for that. Because it was literally the last thing in terms of editing that we did um, with my editor and uh, mentor and PhD supervisor of Kwame Dawes. Mm -hmm. um, he, he said, I remember he sent an email and wanted to meet and he said, I like the poems individually, they seem strong, but as a book, I think we need an extra oomph, something to complicate it further. Because, you know, after all, it's an artwork, right? Um, regardless what had happened, you know, there would be a lot of sentimentality, um, especially in my, you know, relationship with the, the work because of what it meant, right? But then, um, he wasn't pushy he said to try it and see what becomes of it like it's not a big deal and after um, a weekend of thinking about it um, i tried it out and changed all of the you know um, that section from first person to third person and i read it and it gives me you know um, a better insight you know at how that would work, not just for me, but for also the readers, right? Um, because it's like an, a strictly an artistic move, right? Um, because when, when we're reading poems um, with the first person, right, it forces the reader to internalize um, um, the experience. And, it, it, you know, for the book, <laughs> you've read it, it's like pretty intense, right? Um, um, I, I realized that that would be a little bit too much, you know, for the reader, right? And um, what the movement did was to create a sort of distance between the reader and um, also the, the work, right, um, being read. And I thought that was useful in terms of, you know, um, um, looking at the work, right, and even the relationship that can be built. But um, most especially, I think um, that served well because the second section is the dialogue, right, between the daughter and the father, um, and in the second section, you know, the, the poet me moved into the I. And so that the move of the first section complicated that further, right? Because then it served as the poet's subconscious um, voice that foreshadows that conversation that um, eventually happened between um, the, the child and the father. So like, I think that really worked well um, in terms of, you know, um, um, other layer just be beyond just the poems that are in the book but you know like because after all it's a work of art and we have to you know think about um the stories that we 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 intend to tell you know with the poems um, um and yeah i think that that eventually worked out um well um i would assume <laughs> i think it worked really well what what I got out of it was um, I was thinking about times in my own life when I've been through, you know, really intense experiences and often, um, especially with something like a very strong grief and something that happens quickly and you're shocked, you do have a sort of out of body experience where you're watching the scene, you're watching yourself go through the motions of life robotically doing what you have to keep doing, but your mind's kind of out of your body in a sense and I, I for me that um third person narration sort of put me in that state where you're shocked back you know back and I, it felt like a lot of the um 
a lot of the poems um, were working to sort of get get the mind and the spirit back in the body, back into life, you know, um, back in under the skin. Yeah. What did you, how about you, Robbie? What were you thinking about the first section? Um, yeah, with the, with the use of uh, third person, it, I think it, it allowed um, another, in, in terms of a, a deeper connection to the work uh, beyond reading simply of someone else's experience. It was sort of driving forward this narrator. Um, it sort of allowed it to be explored in a, in a, from a completely different angle, which I found incredibly affecting. Mm. It's sort of, and I think it's, it's, it's what you're saying, Michelle, I think it gives sort of like the, almost the body of voice rather than just the mind. Um, it's almost like a psychological um, shift in the way that you're interpreting um, the events. I'm not sure if that was um, what, what it would be for everybody uh, reading it, but it reminded me um, in the way that John Berryman would write, a, write the dream songs, um, just that separation of writing about the self as if the self is another. Um, as Rambo said, you know, I is another. I sort of felt like it gave me that kind of feeling of... Um, the separate self being the same self in order to explore those events in different ways. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's a, that's a really um, great way of putting it. Um, um, because yeah, sometimes, um, especially with self-reflection, right. Um, you're like trying to look inward and, um, the, the best way to see the self is actually from like an outsider um, 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 point of view, right? Um, because it allows us to take the full measure of ourself. It's mm -hmm. weird, but yeah, it's like um, um, a double consciousness or something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I found that some of the poems were more like narrative, you know, and they were, you know, really, um, yeah, they were very affecting in, in one way and then some of the poems are more surrealistic so it uh, sort of suggesting when you you virtually you know, you're so far into grief that you feel you're losing your mind and so um things become a lot darker so i found those poems really really in, intense and affecting as well um i was wondering if you would maybe like to read this one since we, we're talking about the poems but i suppose it would be great for our audience to to hear one well i don't know which one you might worry I, I really loved um the fruit tree because that was one of those more surrealistic ones that i really found um yeah very what about you robbie what were your faves uh um i i got so so many but one of uh, my favorites i love the opening poem uh wine glass yeah um i just kept kept reading it over and over again um and uh, a kind of grief, uh, sorry, a kind of burden. Um, it's definitely one that I would love to hear as well. What would you like to I'd, go for? <laughs> yeah, I'd, um, I mean, if it's okay, I'd um, read those poems. Um, um, yeah. It'd be great, thank you. Wine glass. When your mother found strands of your hair hung up in the teeth of your comb, your father squirreled them into a wine glass. It bites him hard that your life happened like an hourglass with only a handful of sand. This split to the sim of his body, a split of darkness that won't kill him, but squeezes adrenaline into his veins so he leaves through the pain of your absence. He's not all right to speak. His voice rims with bereavement, and he wants to sing by your grave, child, now that birds blow songs through the window. Count sadness on the prayer beads necklaced around his collar. If he had known the sky would inhale you out of him so quickly, he would have stayed with your toes forever in his hands. Your face is still everywhere, even in the places he is not looking. He presses a deep kiss on your grave, on your forehead, hands cloudy from rubbing the grave as if on your tender skin. The distance he feels is more than the 400 kilometers that 
often stands between you. He will travel this far to hold you against the moon. They say you are like his reflection, pulled out of the mirror he stares into. To pull you out, he plunges his hands inside himself and pulls. Incredible. Yeah, I'm uh, bad at locating where the poems are. I think uh, this is in poem page 11. Yeah, I think the fruit trees, yeah, 10 or 11. Uh, thank you. All right, um, yeah, 11, the fruit tree. She comes as a wind with her brother's paw and places it into his palm, the earth spinning on its orbit. As his bare body levitates, her eyes dip and shiny with the ardor of stars. And he asks, what juice comes from the fruit of the placenta tree? She whispers the recipe and he holds it in his body. The river that meets the root and only speaks through the open eyes of leaves. He stays in the company of all her toys as he remembers how she clutches each by the tail. It is her way of keeping in touch. Under the tree, he is in the bat house of memory. She enters his skin and lays hands on bones. He wonders how to feel a ghost's touch, despite the dirt of loss in his eyes. He walks into the fallow of grief the sharp ends of grass cut into skin cracks him open for scavengers. Now the fruit tree is thick as milk and now its seeds bubble like with all the things he has lost as a father. Her soft, her soft fingers on his chin, her eyes that open all the hidden chapters of his body. A ghost is a wine. He drinks this last memory. Mm. So beautiful. Um, one of the things I really um, felt throughout the whole book, you know, there's, um, you know, the, the, the themes or the imagery that keeps cycling around of, of bone and skin and and the physicality of, um, you know, I know I've had three children myself, they're older now, but I remember when they were younger, you know, they're all over you all the time. It's a very tactile, close relationship, especially, you know, Rick Baha was only a year old, so they're always in your arms, you're always feeding them, cleaning them, and so um, what I sensed was um, that that terrible absence of the empty arms, you know, because the weight of your child, the warmth of your child, the breath of your child, um, the sound, the smells, it's that's that would be um, you know physically and as well as emotionally um, very very painful and I felt that a lot in these poems so much um, longing for that that um, that tactile um, closeness again was um, really expressed through a lot of the the sort of sensuous imagery of you know weight and sound and breath that that um, pervaded all the poems really really beautiful. Um, I was um, also thinking about the, um, uh, Robbie was uh, mentioning too, we were having a little chat beforehand and the way objects um, become like relics, you know, um, so what would be your normal objects, you know, a face washer or, a, you know, a bowl or a ball, these things become like sacred relics now and they also keep sort of reoccurring um, throughout, the, throughout the book in a really, really beautiful way. Yeah, um, I remember um, when, because I, I, I missed um, her funeral um, by 30 minutes, you know, Muslims were like always in a hurry to bury our dead. Um, so we, we do it almost immediately. And um, my wife was telling me how when she, Baha passed, um, her mother went to the house and, you know, um, took away all of the clothes um, so that, you know, when she returned home, um, um, there was like that kind of absence too, um, which was, you know, like when I was thinking about it done in, you know, good faith, right? 
um, out of love, but I also was thinking about the violence of that, right? Um, um, how that emptiness can just, you know, take hold. Um, and I remember when we were moving to America, um, um, about seven months after, um, the clothes that she had worn um, uh, during her first birthday, I was asking, where, where, where is that? I want, I want to take it along. Um, and how um, the sand, you know, in her grave became, you know, something that I wanted to, you know, carry along um, um, because, well, you know, that, that the grave is like so far away. And um, um, I know as, as everybody who have buried um, a loved one, right, like the visiting of the grave is like, it's like, a thin, right? Um, um, a constant reoccurrence, you know, um, but that there is that absence too, right? Because now we're not just in another country, but, you know, in another continent. So even that sand became like a relic and, um, a, a thin of, um, that has, um, I don't want to say holy qualities, but I mean, for lack of better words, that's, um, what, what comes to mind. Mm. Yeah, I was thinking about, there was one poem, um, Sadiq, I think it was later in the book, Unexpressed Grief, um, and it really struck me because I remember watching the um, the first launch of, of this book, I think it was through University of Nebraska, and I think you were speaking about how, um, you know, with best of intentions, people were often trying to cheer you up and tell you not to dwell in the dark places and to, you know, to not cry, to to get back into life and so forth, and how, you know, for, for yourself that wasn't helpful, you know, you, you needed to um, go into the dark places. And... Um, I was wondering how much, you know, if uh, since if, if poetry became the place that you could express express that. Yeah, for for me, um, poetry has always um, been that for me, right? Um, because it's not just the way that I understand the world, but also the way that you know, like I talk about the world and to the world. And oftentimes when, you know, they're like things like I, I would say when we pretend, right, that something is not there and it stinks, right, and we sit on it, right, it's still going to be smelly, right? So like embracing what is, accepting what is, is actually part of, you know, moving forward. Right. And I'm always reluctant to talk about healing, right, in terms of loss and grief, right, because like. I don't know if, you know, such a thing is possible. What I know is that, you know, with time, it becomes a lot easier to, to, to carry. It becomes an easier burden. You know, it becomes a part of you um, to just move through the world with, with that pain, right? Because the absence of that pain also is like a kind of violence against whatever that was shared, right, with this person who you love. Because without that pain, it means um 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 memory is fading away right because um, why we feel loss is because of that absence right and um um if we we you know like stop feeling that absence it means like we are recreating experience right but those are actually things that happen but um accepting you know um grief um being in the so-called dark room um allows you know, at least in my case, um, to reckon with what had happened, right? Because it, it became real because uh, I was like in constant state of disbelief. Um, um, but that's, those were the moments that, you know, um, it was real for me that she, she wasn't there. Um, and, you know, there was like always that flicker of light. And that, that's poetry for me, right? It um, showed me the way out of the room, um, it allowed me, you know, to investigate what, what it meant to, to, to lose her. Uh, and it's still that for me because, you know, even right now, um, the, the other day I was telling someone that, you know, it's always like an, a wound and there's like a line in the book that talks about that, how, 
it's a wound that would open and clot and open and clot and open and clot, right? Because like every single day I move into the world, I might see, uh, you know, like she died when she was one. Um, I'm still counting, right? And each time that I see a girl um, of her age, I'm reminded this, you know, she would have been this, she would have been that. And I, I imagine that would continue, right, um, for as long as I leave, because I'd continue to meet people, you know, who might, you know, be maybe 25 years from now, you know, I'm like, yeah, she would have been 25 or 30. And, and I, you know, I, I just assume I'd um, keep counting. And every of those moments come with a different kind of grief, with a different kind of sadness. But, um, I mean... I am happy that, you know, I have um, the palms to, to guide my way through it. Um, sometimes I understand, you know, um, most times I don't, but I mean, that's, that's just it, right? Um, um, yeah, that's just it. Mm. Would you read us that poem, Sadiq? Would that be okay if you read Unexpressed Grief? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I think, uh, page 72, I think, around there. 75, um, unexpressed grief. Twigs lean into the window of the room that was once mine, smelling of fresh leaves, fresh like the crushed mangoes in your mother's juicer. My child, you come as memory to settle in my mind, a query you've never visited before. But the leaves of the mango tree are no longer leaves, just your hands patting my back. To pull your socks from your shoes, I howled the cobwebs that gathered like a crowd. I do not have words of comfort for your mother when she cries, but we perform would do to speak to God. We bow our heads with the same level of reverence I afford my mother. We recite the Quran, for the daughter who has not been dead long enough for the wound to start healing. My mother says we must grieve according to the Quran. This means in peace, without tears or words. But in our grief, you hear its metal rubbing off my bones. In the Quran, there is a solution to every mystery, but not for an unexpressed grief. Beautiful. Um, Robbie, when we were chatting, you were saying that um, the the book is a sort of a body of work reminded you a little bit of um, Ted Hughes and his um, work around grief. In is that the birthday book? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, so it, it, when I was reading it, um, I think it's sort of um, you know as you as you were talking about when you were dealing with the work as a whole as opposed to the individual poems um, as a sort of thematic work with a somewhat of a narrative sort of exploration and it reminded me of a lot of birthday letters by Ted Hughes in that way it's this sort of uh, an indescribable grief a grief that can't be ever be expressed in words and it's just uh, the the work is a testament to that that attempt to to come to terms with it and I was thinking when I was reading it that it's works like this that express things that are beyond most people's understandings do you, it's do you think that poetry has obviously healing is is the wrong word as you said it's not something that can ever the, the these these kind of wounds aren't ever gonna kind of fully be removed at all but do you think that poetry is a way that as people we can find some sort of life again from from these things that we're writing about you know, because you you write a lot about um, Baha in a way that's, you know, she's always um, always being brought back um, through memory, and it reminded me, yeah, a lot of birthday letters in particular. Yeah, um, for me, I always think um, that you know um, the imagination is even more powerful um, than you know the realities that we're part of, right? Um, because like hope to leave without hope means not to leave 
at all, right? And um, that imagination, you know, aids in that. And so bringing her back um, was it an act of defiance, right, against um, death, against reality, um, to say that I can conjure back this that was taken, this body that was taken from me, right? And and the overarching um, um, attempt, you know, is to preserve those memories because, you know, as, as we know, as time goes on, right, um, time blunts the effectiveness of, of memory and memory is also like an experience that is real, right? Um, it happens within us, but it's real, right? Um, it's an experience itself. And um, in writing the book, even though the attempt was um, to, to, and that's her, her brother, her younger brother, Farid. Um, he's adorable, but he's a piece of work too. <laughs> <laughs> and um in, in in bringing her right back is you know within the bound of the book within the world of the book is to say that she would continue to exist right and um for for anybody who picks up the book and read about her that's a way of manifesting her in the world and 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 that's like a big consolation for me because like I do know that you know a lot of people um, have lost you know their loved ones and they can only rely on memory and as we know like memory isn't reliable right um, because it con it's very malleable and it continues to to shift right um, and, and 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 all of that. Yeah. So, oh. um, yeah, I was thinking uh, the same thing, um, Stick, when I read the book. It, to me, it was like one of those pop-up books you have for kids, you know, when you open them up and everything springs up. It felt very real, very animated. Um, we were entering into um, a relationship with Baha through your words, um, not just infant Baha, but in the second um, section of the book where you, you take on that dialogue between um, your voice and and her voice and and her voice is quite a sophisticated voice you know she doesn't write as a as a child or an infant you know so you're not just using words to uh, keep her memory alive but actually using imagination to project forward and to create create memories as you say of Baha at 10 20 30 and, and so forth so um, she continues to grow so it was really interesting reading experience and very moving because although um yes the book is about grief and it's about um you know a child who is no longer here but she felt so present so alive and as you say that act of defiance from you animating her through your words you know um it was incredibly beautiful yeah um thank you so much um yeah yeah, and um, there's um, there's a time uh, back in Nigeria. I think it was around um, 2012. Um, I was um, sick for a very long time, um, and I thought I was going to die. And I, I do remember um, my language at that time was one that has no pretense, right? And I'll joke about it years after that. You know, people gain wisdom. Uh, there's like a certain wisdom that, you know, humans gain when they, you know, push in their exit, their transition out of this world. Um, um, so, yeah, when you were talking about the voice of Baha, right, um, I was thinking about that. And, um, um, yeah, I, I thought it was just interesting. Sometimes when you listen, you know, to... Um, um, others talk about your our own work, right? You know, like it it gives us a, a kind of insight that otherwise, you know, we would never, um, um, you know, um, have the opportunity of um, of seeing or hearing. Yeah. Um, I was um, wondering, Sadiq, as well, when you're talking about um, the way that others are going to consume your work, and I was talking about um, the similarities thematically to something like birthday letters. With the subject matter of this book, obviously it's not something that there is a lot of, of comparable work that you can you can be reading to. So, you know, you've got um, you know, certain writers like Robert Lowell and um, people like that who have written about 
somewhat similar things. But as far as your poetic influences when it came to writing this book, if you were going to be looking at putting it together as a piece of work, would you be able to just give us an idea of sort of what you were reading or what was inspiring you as far as poetry? Yeah, um, so that's an interesting question, right? Um, because um, at the time, I just wanted to get out the words, right? Um, those um, seemed um, more urgent, right? Um, and I was like really relying on experiences um, that were real, right? Um, in terms of, you know, um, what I experienced with the child and experiences that were imagined the things that I wanted to do um, with the child. Um, and I, I, I remember um, there are like some, some of the poems that have um, um, lines by um, some other poets. Um, sometimes I, I, I just hang in there, right? Mm. And do not know how to move um, the poems forward. And I, I, it, it, it happened with a poem, Elegy, um, elegy in the evening because every day, like it's around twelve thirty, that I um, go into that ritual of writing. And so when I began elegy, um, I, I realized that they're like missing places, right? Like they're like things that you know the poem needed a lot more to move it forward. And so I, uh, I was um, reading Paul Salon that evening and um, um, his poem, Dead Fuge. And um, I remember reading the line, black milk of morning, they drink you at night. Um, black milk of morning, they drink you at night. And I thought that absolutely worked well with the, with the poem that I was writing. Um, and I just plugged it in there, right? Um, of course, italicized, um, and it just became the part of the poem. Um, there's also um, some with with wine glass. Um, that I was reading um, some rocks a chore, and that still um, there was a line: "If I had known the sky would inhale you out of him so quickly." That too, I thought, you know, um, just was so beautiful and articulated what I was feeling, you know, in ways that um, I couldn't um, at that particular moment. And I just put those poems in conversation with um, these writers who were like um, absolutely brilliant. Um, um, yeah. So um, I wasn't really deliberate in, in terms of, you know, looking at what other, people's have, other people have done in terms of grief. Um, I, um, just, um, went about, you know, my normal engagement, right? Um, because again, I know that it's important for poets sometimes to be in conversation with other people, but in terms of the book, um, I wanted it to be my voice, my aesthetics. Um, and so like I resisted, um, looking at other work, particularly about grief. I know a, a few friends recommended books, um, for me to read, um, especially when I, you know, shared the work um, for feedback and all of that. But um, I um, quietly resisted that. Um, and some of them, you know, uh, this would come as a surprise because, you know, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to do it. Um, but yeah, I never did um, because I wanted um, the, the voice in the book to be um, as genuine as possible um, in that regard. Mm. Incredible. Did you... Um... While you may not have been reading um, particularly for um, uh, looking for influences or the way other poets um, dealt with grief and loss, did you find yourself turning to poetry as a, as a, a sort of a salvation, just, just needing to read other people's experiences? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, so the thing with me, like um, um, prose does that for me. Um, so I, I, I would, um, turn to prose instead of, um, um, poetry, um, that just, um, evokes a lot of things in me, right? Um, it leads me to, um, places of discovery, right? Um, to discover language, um, for my, um, poetry, um, to just, you know, wonder of how 
sometimes when you want to write, you listen to to um, songs, right? Or you just um, take a walk and um, immerse yourself in the beauty and serenity of the landscape, right? Um, so for me, instead of turning towards poetry, I turn away from poetry when I really want to write poetry. Um, and yeah, I did a lot of um, reading um, of prose, you know, just for my own entertainment with the hope that, you know, something would resonate um, um, or at least push me to a place where I would um, excavate, you know, my own emotion, um, the memory of my daughter, um, to find a language that, you know, would um, um, express what I wanted to be said. A lot of times um, I failed at that, um, which is, you know, with language always, that's um, inevitable, um, but it wasn't as a result of not trying. And um, the whole book is uh, a testament to my attempt to um, articulate this thing that weighed me down. Um, I, I don't know if it was success, success, but, you know, I imagine it, it isn't right um, because um, again, this is an attempt, you know, to replicate what I was feeling. It's not like exact replica of it, but you know, as poet, this is what we have to do, right? Um, to attempt to fail, and then whatever comes out of that, you know, exercise, you know, becomes the work of art. And um, every single day, right? Um, um, I continue to push you know, myself towards language, um, um, to, to, um, talk about what I'm feeling in the moment, right. In terms of, um, this grief and how it's evolving the beginning of the book, especially the first, first section, um, was, um, you know, there's like a lot of things, rage, um, regret, and um, it was like a, a lot of emotional outburst, right. But as you know, the walk moves further um some of that that you know got toned down and that just happened organically right and 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 so like that also is a, a testament to that pursuit um, um of language to just um um understand and speak about what had happened mm. Oh, beautiful. Um, I was thinking maybe if we could end on a poem, unless there's something else you would like to ask, Robbie, do you have any burning questions? Uh, there's so many things that, that came to mind when I was reading this book. I sort of, I just think it, it's, I don't even really know how to articulate them properly, to be honest, because I, I, the kind of work that's always resonated with me is works that, for better or worse, are the product of a lot of pain from people that have had very painful lives and horrible things that have happened to them. And I just wonder um, where you think poetry sits in terms of the world now, where obviously we're in an age where people are not not willing really to engage with longer works, even, you know, a book of poems as opposed to sort of, you know, we live in a, you know, clickbait kind of society, you know, now where people have very short attention spans. So I'm just wondering what kind of a, what, what, where do you think your book exists now in, in, in the world as it is now, given what it is and poetry in general, I'm just always interested to know what people think of in a digital world, when, the, where the books of poetry and works of poetry of, of this nature, which I say is true poetry, where does that exist now? Yeah, so um, f for me, um, even in having this conversation with um, the two of you, right, um, and even if that's just it, it suffices, right, because for me, the most important thing is to um, keep my daughter alive, even if in a stranger's mouth, right, and I have already done that, and, and, and I think um, regardless of how it's done, right? The name is out there in the world and, um, that's, that's done. That's successful in that way. Right. Um, because even in engaging with her and her memory, um, it's been changed since the book came out. Right. Um, like a lot of things that I, you know, wasn't able to talk about, 
And hell, even with the palms, there's still a lot of palms that I'm unable to read. But um, the book exists, and because it exists, my daughter continues to exist. Um, as regard to you know the world and you know um, um, the click and bait nature of it, I mean, I. I always think about the self, myself, and um, what I think about the work that I do. Um, it's good, you know, to pay attention to the to the world, right? Because after all, we're writing because we want the work to be read. But again, the integrity of the work has to be preserved, right? Um, regardless what the nature of the world is. Sometimes as artists, you know, um, the world needs to catch up, right? And, you know, we're, we're going to try our best, you know, to aid the world in that journey, but we still have to tr stay true to the art, right? Um, to write the poems in the way that they deserve to be written, um, regardless of what's in vogue, right? Um, you know, because, you know, we all would hopefully want to be the kind of poets that would um, be read, um, you know, years after our passing, right? And and some of those poets that are being read today were actually ahead of their time, right? Um, you know, they weren't read when they were alive. I'm sure that Edgar Allan Poe would be surprised that we're still reading him, right? Um, because, you know, um, um, no one paid attention, you know, um, or at least serious attention um, while he was alive, so... Yeah, I, I don't think, you know, I concern myself a lot about that. I just want to do um, the best work possible. Um, and, you know, um, the best... I don't even think about, you know, writing a great poem, right? Like, I don't, you know, um, think about that. Um, because I think it's a longer journey. And eventually, I just want to be looked upon, right? And you see the whole picture all of the steps that have taken, the ones that have failed, and you see that movement, and that's my hope as an artist. Well, this book is an incredible achievement. Thank you so much. Thank you. It really is, Sadiq. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if we could finish with one of the poems where you do um, imagine Baha forward. So I noticed that in the book there was a lot of... Um, Poems that began with the phrase, you know, today Baha is not dead. And then you went on to imagine, you know, her in lots of different um, situations. And one that I really loved was, was called Learning About Constellations. I think it's earlier on in the book. Um, and I would thought if, if that's okay with you, that would be a beautiful way to end. Yeah. Um, yeah. I would um, read that poem. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, learning About Constellations. Today, Baha is not dead. She's 12 years old, sits beside a flower vase, presses her tomb to the clay, her heart boards into a magnificent sun, waterfalls its warmth all over her satin face. Taller than all her classmates, in the corner, she leans her head to white paper, Calves moons out of her notebook while other children sit and listen to the teacher. The class is learning about constellations. She takes colors off a flower, folds it to her skin, a chameleon, gathering coats from leaves. She questions daisies, reveals all suggestions when he stares into her eyes. Baha grabs a, a speck of darkness molds it into a moth and places it in the darkest point in his eyes. He sits close to his daughter in the yard, joins her and the moths. Baha is not dead. She's walking her way into myth, a world of new constellations, where buried milk nourishes the placenta to heal his broken bones, broken eggshell of his heart, mend each back together, with the energy of a clock that never stops moving backward. Stunning. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing um, 
this um, book with us and your thoughts with us and um, yeah, sharing Baha with the world through your words. Thank you, Sadiq. Thank you, Sadiq. Yeah, thank you so much um, for having me and um, for all the wonderful things that you do for points around the world, not just, you know, in Australia, right? Um, it's just um, um, a way that we've collapsed the world into the smaller space where we can, you know, interact as artists. And, uh, you know, again, I, you know, must confess, you know, the, the work that you do is really important. Um, um, and I am glad, you know, um, to have come across all of you and, you know, you're also amazing works. Um, I remember the first time that, um, I spoke with Robbie, um, it's, um, about a poem of his that was published in, um, um, poetry foundation. And yeah, I was like really excited, um, to have met, you know, all of you through your words and also, um, your, your work that you do as editors. Thank you so much. Yeah, th thank you so much. Um, thank, thank you. Bye, guys.